in these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zeiger livecast. Welcome to this live cast on our future economies. Capitalism, despite the tremendous increase in worldwide welfare through its innovative power and freedom, has at the same time a number of negative consequences. A transition is necessary to overcome ecological destruction, decrease in quality of life and growing inequality. Given geopolitical developments, Europe has an important role to play in this transition. In the live casts, we will start an open dialogue and discuss this transition with internationally renowned economists from all over the world. Questions will pass by, such as Each week, we will discuss these matters with two economists resulting in 10 online dialogues in 10 weeks, where we will share viewpoints and collect ideas on how capitalism's innovative and creative powers can go hand in hand with fostering an equal and just society. A different subject every week. Together we can build a basis for economies that are beneficial to all of us. You can participate by putting your questions and remarks in the chat. So, let's talk. Good evening or good afternoon, uh, I have to say welcome to the seventh edition of the series The Future of Capitalism, a series initiated and designed by Moral Markets in collaboration with Pakhuis de Zwijger here in Amsterdam. And today uh, we talk about how markets can be re reconciled with ecology. Um, because as uh, probably most of you are really aware, we are facing enormous economic uh, environmental crises. Water pollution, air quality, so soil fertility uh, are just among few of the pressing environmental urgencies we have, uh, not to speak about climate change. And to what extent is this, are these crises related to the current economic system we have in the world? Um, how can we preserve or even repair our natural environment um, in, uh, an, uh, uh, in, in an economic system which is respecting these uh, important uh, um, environmental issues? Which ones, what can European governments do or what can the EU as a supranational institute do? How can markets be designed in such a way that they take into account the planetary boundaries? Uh, should firms start with pricing environmental damage into their pro product prices or should governments introduce taxes? We talked about th this already in previous editions. And what is the role of consumers or citizens in this process? Today, we talk to two uh, international renowned economists. The first we're going to speak to is Julia Steinberger and she researches and teaches in the interdisciplinary areas of ecological economics and industrial ecology. Her research examines the connections between resource use and societal performance. She is the recipient of the Leverhelm Research Leadership Award for her research project Living Well Within Limits, uh, which investigates how universal human well-being might be achieved within those important planetary boundaries. She is also lead author for the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report with Working Group 3. We're honored that she's present today. Uh, via internet. The second economist we're, we're going to speak to today is Anne Petit Four, and she's a political economist and author, public speaker. Her latest book, The Case for the Green New Deal, was published in 2019. But back in 2003, as editor of the Real World Economic Outlook, she predicted an Anglo-American debt deflationary crisis, and this was followed in 2006 by the book predicting the global financial crisis. She knew before it started. The book was called The Coming First World Debt Crisis. 
she is now the director of Prime Policy Research in Macroeconomics, a network of economists that promote Keynes monetary theory and policies and that focus on the role of the financial sector in the economy. And we're also honored that she is present today. And every, every event we organize in this series is kickstarted by a young economist. And tonight that is Elisa Terragno Bogliaccini. She is a researcher at Our New Economy and she is kickstarting with an opening statement on behalf of a think tank of young economists this event. After that, these two, the two economists I just introduced to you will be interviewed by my co-host David, David van Overbeek. Uh, and after that, we will have an open conversation between, between our guests. Uh, and uh, we will also give the floor to questions from you. If you are watching this at 6.30, uh, uh, we, you know, on which time this is broadcasted, um, you are too late to participate in asking questions because we pre-record this edition. Some of you who already uh, uh, gave, wanted to be part of this conversation have been invited uh, to join us now and hopefully you'll ask questions and help us making this into a very thriving discussion. Um, I hope, uh, I hope uh, lots of you uh, are doing that. Um, let's start. And um, I'm, I'm honored to give the floor to Elisa Terragno Bocliaccini. Thank you, Natasha. It must not be news for anyone in this virtual room, that we're facing a severe crisis on all fronts. With the coronavirus hitting 44 million worldwide cases this week, the Arctic ice caps not yet refreezing in November, and unemployment rates soaring worldwide. And what is worse, the top 1% of the world's population owning more than half of the world's wealth. Me, personally, I can't seem to stop thinking about what Ernst Friedrich Schumacher famously said back in the 70s. The real problems of our planet are not economical, uh, economic or technical, they are philosophical. The philosophy of unbridled materialism is being challenged by events. In other words, our insatiable longing for consumption and our fixation with the material world is slapping us in the face, showing us their consequences in the form of unavoidable health, economic and environmental disasters. For me and for many others in my generation, the disconnect between humans and our surroundings is becoming ever more clear. I have an economics degree. I have lived human disconnect. Mark Maslin already warned us in 2014, climate change challenges the very way we organize our society. And he was absolutely correct. Our self-serving short-termism is a clear obstacle in achieving meaningful climate action. And it is precisely there where our analysis must begin. In the last decades, rather than societal value creation and contribution to the real economy, shareholder value maximization has dominated decision-making at companies, driving executive compensation up to 940% since, uh, since the late 70s. A similar short-termism is observed in the extraction of resources across our Earth. A clear example being leftist governments in Latin America resorting to resource extraction for alleviating social pressures, which is well-intentioned, but it's short-termism nonetheless. Here in the Global North, despite the signing of several agreements, restless activist efforts and government promises, millionaire financial contracts for petrol extraction have been signed as recently as last year. The power dynamics inherent in the linkages between the private sector and the financial system pose a key problem for ecological safety. Financial interests make the world go round. And if these interests are focused on the wrong investments, our green deals and green recovery plans have nothing to offer in counter. So what is there to do about this? 
One famous approach is that which the European Commission proposed last December, the European Green Deal. And this Green Deal proposes something called the Just Transition Mechanism in order to compensate for the unequal starting position of different countries across the EU. Such a mechanism, as both speakers may know already, consists of one fund and two loan facilities, amounting up to 150 billion euro, which is basically a 0.9% of last year's EU GDP. But the question remains, how will this money be allocated? It seems that so far, it will follow the usual path of the green growth paradigm. Finance a couple of sustainable infrastructure projects here and there, but what solutions does it offer to counter the structural power imbalances between and within countries? Last week, doing some research into this mechanism, I found out that the term just transition was coined by the International Trade Union Confederation, who was embracing the idea of precipitatory processes to ensure a bottom-up approach to the energy transition. In my opinion, this is very much lacking in this just transition mechanism. Another approach is the very popular sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And don't get me wrong, they do represent a great commitment of countries across the globe, and they do specifically talk about reaching those furthest behind. However, it also seems to me that their lack of specificity be beats its own purpose, namely ensuring that those at the very bottom contribute to creating solutions that work for them. My question is then to you both, Professor Steinberger and Dr. Pettifor. What can be done to tackle these very difficult issues? And what role can markets play in this, if any? Thank you. Thank you. And let's go uh, to our first in-depth interview with uh, Ju Professor Julius Steinberg. David. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Professor Steinberger, for being here with us tonight. Tonight, we're discussing how we can reconcile markets with ecology. Now, when discussing ecology, one almost immediately touches upon the issue of growth. And in an article you published on open democracy you, in April this, this year, you make the case that the way Western governments have responded to the initial developments of the corona crisis has shown that we are indeed growth obsessed. Now, the first question I'd like to ask you is, what do you mean by that? What does it amount to that governments or we, our economies, are growth obsessed? Um, thanks for that, that question. Um, hi, everybody. It's really uh, nice to be here. Um, so the, the way that our governments are growth obsessed, um, uh, the way I described it in the article is that there are three different ways. One is that governments see their role and their usefulness as contributing to economic growth. And I think that there is a, a big um, rejoinder to the, the question uh, that we were asked at the beginning um, about the, this role of materialism and consumption and uh, uh, the, 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 this philosophy of unbridled materialism and short-termism. This is not necessarily, I would say, something that's caused by consumers. I would say that the, the, the consumer society is actually the result of a growth um, uh, a growth-oriented economy. A growth-oriented economy has mm -hmm. to create consumers because mm -hmm. it's constantly overproducing. So our governments tend to view their success as related to how much they can enable the economy to grow and everything else becomes secondary. So even the health of the planet, even the health of their own citizens, they don't see those goals as primordial anymore. So they have a wrong um, focus on what could be, should, could and should be done for, for correct governance. Uh, I think that that's one way. Uh, the other way is that we have the structural imperative to growth through the way that capitalism operates, which is um, the increasing pursuit of profits. And because of that, we th there's no choice within a capitalist economy. In order to survive, firms have to compete with each other and have to um, pursue growth. And so that's sort of baked into the way our, our, our markets operate. Mm -hmm. And so these, these things are quite uh, structurally uh, foundational of our current economies. 
So, do you think that it's possible? Can the t can the conditions for a new economy, for example, based on the principles of, of ecology, um, exist under capitalism or under a for-profit logic? I think that if capitalism is to be maintained, it has to be. Uh, so I'm um, quite critical of capitalism, not just fossil capitalism, not just unequal capitalism, the whole the whole thing. I don't think it has. I don't think capitalism has a lot of options, actually. I think it has to be extractive and it has to be unequal. It drives inequality. Thomas Piketty has shown this very clearly. Um, one of the great economists of our time who happens to look at real numbers. Um, so I think that uh, I think that we can try to do something quite different. And the way that we do something quite different has to be uh, through social movements. So it has to come back to democracy. It has to come back to people power. Mm -hmm. And I think that movements like the climate strikes, like the Sunrise Movement in the US, um, uh, and like the Just Transition, uh, as it was mentioned in, in its original uh, bottom-up formulation, that has to do with working people who want their their work and their active potential to really contribute to something positive in society. I think that yeah. that's a very different direction. Yeah. So how has the corona crisis currently shown us that we are indeed in this predicament, that we are too growth dependent? Uh, the coronavirus is it's accelerated. It's, it's sort of been an accelerated crash test of what a lot of us have already been seeing happening with the, the climate crisis, which is that our governments are just not taking, first of all, don't take it seriously enough, don't act fast enough faced with an exponential problem. Um, they're not acting in terms of preventative measures. They're not taking the precautionary principle of protecting people. And, uh, and what we see is that they, they take decisions that are expedient to their friends, to their economic priorities, to their, in the UK, we have um, all kinds of scandals about who received contracts for medical equipment even, uh, so that they're really uh, behaving in a way that's very um, detrimental to the long-term health of most of the population. And for climate, it's been exactly the same, but on a longer time scale. Um, and so I would say that the two, the two situations are very similar, that the kinds of dysfunction we're seeing with corona are the same kinds that we have been seeing play out for decades with climate. Yeah. Now, um, we're discussing economics tonight, of course, but we also necessarily have to touch upon the topic of politics and in your article you describe the kind of political style which we've uh, seen over the last couple of decades here in the west uh, politicians and politics on the basis of absence instead of presence right focusing on markets um, have politicians over time perhaps transferred some accountability to the market have they used it to that extent Yes. So one of the ways that uh, that our current economic system works is it's sort of eating itself. It's like the snake eating its own tail, and it focuses. It works on on debt, um, and this is something that Anne Pettiford knows a lot more than about than I do, and is a leading expert in. So I'm just going to sketch out what this means in terms of the government. Is that we have governments and households actually as well that have been sort of caught into the debt spiral and selling off assets, selling off productive capacity in exchange for, for short-term financial relationships uh, where you're, you're sort of making the books balance a bit better that year, but in the long term, you're in, you're in more and more debt. So one of the problems with our governments is that they've actually turned over to the private sector in very financialized ways, the very assets that would allow us to protect ourselves from the perspective of public investment, public reorientation. Um, so we have utilities, transport system, our whole, most of our infrastructure, our health systems are very much privatized, even if you, they are in fact privatized, even if they are not um, overtly, you know, even there's still the NHS or whatever label or public health above the, the door, the privatization is still happening. And that means that our governments are sort of leaving, they have this ideology of leaving things to the market, but also in very real ways, they've dispossessed themselves of the economic power um, for orienting what, how they could protect us. And they have to go through these market mechanisms that are often very costly and very and um, costly in the future as well. You're, you're really putting yourself into a relationship where you commit year after year to be paying these companies regardless of what else you might want to do. Yeah, yeah, clear. Um, so what are you mentioned some of these structural elements that were, that we need to address. What of the these elements three I mean you mentioned um, is the most keen that we tackle today, which should we focus on right now? I 
think right now I would focus on exposing uh, these mechanisms as a form of corruption. So I think that the only way we get through this is by a revival of democracy and by a revival of democracy that takes the economic sphere into its, into its orbit, where we do not allow important life or death decisions to be made by the market. The market is not a neutral <laughs> law of nature. It's not just something... <laughs> It's not just something out there that just exists on its own and makes the best decisions for us like Adam Smith hoped it would. Um, it is basically directed by very rich individuals who are accumulating wealth, including accumulating extraordinary wealth during our time of crisis of the Corona crisis. And these same people will accumulate during the climate crisis as well. They will always find ways to make money out of misery. Um, so we need to turn this into a, a question of democracy and we need to have a democracy that takes economics in with it. So I think that it has to do a lot with education, with journalism, exposing corruption, exposing this um, unfair and unequal accumulation that's detrimental to the rest of us. And it has to do with imagining new forms of uh, the economy that are democratic, where our decision making includes what happens in the economy. We don't say, oh, this doesn't concern us anymore. This is beyond our control. We say, no, actually, as citizens, we are also part of the economy and we get to decide what firms do, how much they profit, how much bosses get paid, how much salary differential there is, what the purpose of a firm is. Should it be to accumulate profit? Should we even allow that? Is that actually a pro-social behavior? We have social, we give every firm, every economic entity that operates in our economies, we give them social license. And I think for a lot of them, it's time to take social license away, including for the fossil fuel companies, but including probably quite a few others. So who should take the lead in this change you envision? Who are, or I think, or I think that, I think that quite a few groups are already um, doing a lot. Uh, and I think that, for instance, the youth climate movement, so the, the, the climate strikes, Fridays for Future, are, are doing quite a bit. I think that um, certain alliances around the European Green New Deal have been trying to do quite a bit. So I know that the Zoe Institute and um, uh, economic think tanks like the New Economics Foundation or the Next System Foundation, I think they're called in the, in the US. So there are a lot of groups that are thinking about alternative economics in really creative ways. And they're allied with popular movements um, that are basically youth movements uh, that really are challenging the status quo very, very openly in a way that previous environmental movements did not allow themselves to do. They sort of really position themselves more as a fringe topic. Now these, these groups are bringing the environment and social justice together in the center of a core challenge to our current economic systems. And yeah. so I think that that's the kind of uh, the work we need to be joining in with. Yeah. So in this series, we have often seen that where difficulty comes in is that we, although we have good policies that maybe a majority of the people agrees on, or that we or we we know that we need to take action on right now, um, what is actually required is also a political climate in which these ideas can come to fruition. Do you have any thoughts on how we can uh, work to create that such an environment? I think that, the, again, one of the most important things uh, from my perspective is really to expose corruption and to expose the work of, you know, for instance, deliberate disinformation that's been happening on the climate side. We know for decades that these companies have been doing this kind of disinformation. The automotive industry is not far behind. The automotive industry is uh, right up there with uh, the, the, the great disinformers. Uh, so we, we, I think we need to make a transparent case for why these industries don't have the right to operate and don't have the right to dictate policies, certainly in the way that they used to. And, um, and the, the only way to do that, it, to, to create the political climate that allows us to do that is to, cre to create a, the awareness of how angry we should be by the ways that our economies have been manipulated and our politicians and uh, leaders have been lied to and been complicit in this kind of grand corruption where we're now facing these multiple crises. These crises were avoidable. Both the coronavirus and uh, the, the climate crisis are avoidable crises because we've known about at least their potential for a very long time. And so I think we have every right to be angry and we have every right through that anger and through that awareness that we really need to change quite a bit to create the political climate we need. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Steinberger. Looking forward to discussing this with you at length during our discussion session. Uh, let's move on for now.
Yes. And that is uh, the next thing on uh, our agenda of this afternoon is an in-depth interview again by uh, David van Overbeek with Dr. Annie Pettifor. It's an honor that you're here. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to give the floor to David now. Thank you, Natasha. Professor Pettifor, thank you for joining us tonight here with us, uh, for being here with us, thank you. Um, in your book, The Case for the Green New Deal in 2019, you take up arms against defeatism with regard to the climate crisis. We need to act and we need to act now. I know this may be a difficult question, but what is your case for the Green New Deal in short? The case for the Green New Deal is um, simply this that it's imperative for the environmental movement to understand that in order for us to save the planet, we have to transform the econo eco economic system. And what happened in the past, my experience, is environmentalists worried enormously about the environment, about nature, about water, about trees, and, and, and about biodiversity and sort of believed that the economy belonged in another box and someone else was responsible for it. And so the case for the New Deal, the Green New Deal, is that we should do what Roosevelt did in 1933. He actually brought together the issues of the economy and of the environment. You must remember he was dealing with desertification in the United States, the desertification of the Great Plains, which they called the Dust Bowl. Right. So he had an enormous environmental challenge, plus he had an enormous unemployment challenge. And what he did was he understood you had to change the economic system in order to deal with the ecosystem. And that is the case for the Green New Deal. Yes. So just as with um, Professor Steinberg, I'd like to start with the corona crisis. Just take that as a leeway point into further discussion. Um, actually, a reappreciation of government interaction in the market and retaking some, taking back some control that we've granted to the market that we left over there. Now, during the corona crisis, we've seen some financial stimulus programs of central banks, governments, etc. Have these been good for the ecological agenda in general or not? No, they haven't. They've been designed to bail out the private finance sector and the private and private markets. You know, they've helped companies like Apple, which really didn't need help at all. And to an extent, they have helped governments to spend. And that has happened here in Britain and it's happening in the United States. But the fact of the matter is that the, the real intention of the central banks was to protect the finance, in particular, the private Wall Street in the city of London and Frankfurt. Those were the targets for protection, not the people of Britain, Europe and the United States or China. Uh, or China and Vietnam are very different here, but of other countries. So, so the, the aim is not to protect the people. The, the, the aim is to protect in particular financial markets, but also commercial markets. That's what it's been about. And we've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as Julia rightly said, here in Britain, we've watched as the government has protected markets in pharmaceuticals, right, has allowed them to take control of the administration of the test and trace and, and isolation system. We have a public health sector that could do this very efficiently. And we know that the only way to tackle a, a plague, a pandemic, is by putting boots on the ground and knocking on doors in order to check whether or not people had been tested and were isolating. But that has no longer taken place here. Instead, the invisible hands of the market have been put in charge of testing and tracing, and it has failed catastrophically. So we've seen governments, and our governments are neoliberal governments, they are governments in hock to these markets. We've seen them target their support to those markets and not to the people. And that's what's causing a major political eruption, both here in Britain uh, but I'm afraid around the world, I really do. I think it explains in part the kind of support that Donald Trump gets. You know, it's extraordinary to me on the eve of the United States election that 44, 45% of Americans still support Donald Trump. And they do that because they believe that somehow he's, cha he's challenging the economic system. You know, mm. they're wrong, of course, mm. but that's what they believe. Mm. They believe that the rest are all in cahoots with the system. And I have to say, there is some truth in that. Yeah. So it has been in favor of markets and not especially... I'm sorry, but it's quite hard to hear you. You're, when you introduced it, it goes very quiet. So could you start again, please? Is it audible right now? 
Yeah, it's totally that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, it's been beneficiary to markets, but not necessarily to the people. But then the argument will also go, people would say, well, in the end, markets also benefit people. So what would you say to those individuals who say that? I would say that we've had markets for 5,000 years or more. You know, societies invented markets way even before in prehistory, really. We had, we had systems where we exchanged and undertook transactions. It's perfectly natural. But we managed those markets. Our, our, you know, the heads of our community, our uh, unions, uh, our, our collective bodies, our society managed the market. Is the market open every day? No, we only open on Wednesdays or Fridays. Who is allowed to sell at the market? We decided. What are they allowed to sell? Are they allowed to sell a pint of beer when actually they're only selling a half a pint of beer in there? Who is measuring the pint of beer? Who is measuring the yard of cloth, right? We, for all time, have managed that process of markets, right? So we've welcomed markets into our communities, but on conditions and terms. We have a small market in my, my town. We decide when it is they can operate, when they can open up their stores. We decide who can do that. We, 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 we decide what they can sell. We don't allow them to sell drugs, for example. So the, our problem has been that we've allowed markets to in fact govern us while we've given up the government of markets. And that's what's delusional. It's crazy. Mm. You know, markets can't do that. Mm. They're not, they are a kind of abstract place where we undertake transactions. Yeah. They are not a form of government. And yet we are governed by, for example, Wall Street. Wall Street is a market in finance. They govern, they effectively govern global, the global economy. And they did that before the 1930s as well and caused the 1929 crash and a devastating depression and then ultimately a world war. So, you know, we are very familiar with how markets can destroy our economies and can lead to war. Um, and yet we still allow politicians to give markets or people who run in work in markets yeah. enormous powers. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to discuss uh, this at further length in during the discussion part. Uh, before we move on to the ecology, um, Professor Pettifor, um, I'd like to ask you about another topic, which is very prevalent within your work uh, in the production of money in 2015, but also in the case for the New Green Deal. Um, you put a lot of emphasis on monetary issues. It's kind of being uh, kind of the ground on which we build uh, our economic system and uh, society, etc. Uh, why is it so crucial to address these monetary issues to your mind? And what issues do we need to address today rather tomorrow than tomorrow? So the reason why it's important to address monetary issues is that money is absolutely fundamental to the way our economy operates. We all know that for all of us, for our daily lives, money is so important. And yet we don't understand what it is. We don't understand where it comes from. We don't know who produces it. And we don't know the terms on which they produce it, really. We're ignorant as a society on the whole. And I have to say, it's not just ordinary people in the street who are ignorant. Mm. Economists are ignorant. Mm. Until 2014, when the Bank of England stopped the debate by issuing a document in which they explained how credit is created, how money is created. You know, we had a huge argument between old-fashioned econ orthodox economists and those of us who are monetary theorists, right? And it's shocking to me that after, you know, I mean, you know, we, uh, uh, we have a brilliant uh, Scottish economist. We had a brilliant Scottish economist here, um, John Law. In 1694, 1680s, 90s, he understood the nature of money, the nature of credit. He understood that all money is credit, right? And yet still today, our economics profession doesn't understand this and doesn't talk about it. Now, for me... Uh, this may sound as if, make me sound as if I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I think there's a reason for that. It's better that we don't know. It's better that the 1%, Wall Street, the city of London, Frankfurt, understand and, hold, and manage the whole thing. It's better that the public should be ignorant from that point of view, right? So the economists are playing a game with the 1% to, yeah. to keep us all ignorant. And when we're ignorant, that means they can use money 
to exploit us. And boy, do they do that. Mm -hmm. The amount of credit circulating in the economy is three times the amount of real economic output, basically. It's just extraordinary. So, you know, money can be created out of thin hair, essentially, um, by central banks, but most of money is created by private banks. And they created every time you and I apply for a loan, uh, we ask for a loan, we ask for money, and the, the banks, the private banks, have been given a license to provide us with that money, but on terms and conditions. Number one, we have to sign a contract and promise to repay. Number two, we have to often provide collateral to prove that we, you know, we're worth what we say we're worth. We have to show our, our, our paycheck mm -hmm. to check that we're able to blah, and we have to apply a rate of interest. And when we do that, the banks enter numbers into a computer and transform it to your account, as we all know from our own experience, but with those terms and conditions, right? That's yeah. how effortless it is to create money. So if banks can do that, they can do all kinds of con tricks. For example, they can lie about collateral. They can set up dodgy contracts. They can charge very high rates of interest for nothing, for, for an activity that's effort, effectively effortless. So because we don't understand how the money is created, they can do all that. They can cheat and lie and make extraordinary sums of money, so before, historically unprecedented. So, and that's why I think understanding money is so important. All right. And just so one final quick question, uh, um, Professor Petty, for um, why do we need to understand the way that this money, what we learn when we take note of the the, 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 the historic so-called conspiracy that you mentioned, or, you know, the, the, the things that we don't know about money, what we learn with regard to ecology, what can we learn from that? What is the relation there? Well, our relationship is this, it's quite straightforward, that in order to repay interest on debt, which doesn't take any effort to create, you have to extract assets from labor on the one hand, you have to exploit people, and from the earth on the other. You have to chop down trees, you have to fish the seas, you know, you have to uh, exploit the land, you have to till the land until, you know, there is no land left, or to repay these huge sums of money generated by interest. So for us as ecologists, we have to understand the direct link. When Brazil, bur when Brazil burns down her forests in order to grow soya beans, that's because forestry doesn't give her enough hard currency to repay her foreign debts. So she has to grow soya beans, which is more profitable for her, right? So we need to understand that, that actually a lot of the exploitation of the earth and extraction of fossil fuels mm -hmm. and of the land yes. and, and, and of all the earth's assets is to repay the financiers, to repay Wall Street, the city of London and Frankfurt. And when we get that, we'll understand that one of the reasons why we've had this conflict with nature is because we've been stripping forests, we've been mining, we've been building houses, we've been expanding uh, economic activity into those wildlife uh, habitats. Yes. And that's given us a massive, massive climate crisis problem and now equally an enormous public health problem in the form of pandemics. And yes. by the way, there are meant to be pandemics in the pipeline coming down the road. <laughs> All right, a very ominous tale. Thank you, Professor Perifor. And uh, let's move on the to way, the discussion part. Can I just interrupt you for a moment? Oh. <laughs> Julia, Julia is a professor. I'm not a professor. So thank you very much how for would, the honour, but I'm not a professor. I'm a doctor, perhaps. Yes. How would you like us to address you? Dr. Pettifor. Dr. Pettifor. OK, thank you very much. We'll do so from here on out. <laughs> Yeah, it's a. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I, I thought uh, in my introduction I, I I I had the right title, so thank you for clarifying that. Um, let's go to Professor Steinberger to respond to this um, ominous ending to 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 do the interview with um, with with, with Dr. Patterfor. Uh What is your first reaction to what she uh, brought it brought to the table? 
So um, I'm a huge uh, fan of um, Dr. Pettifor's work. I think that she has been talking about these issues and in a way that people can really understand. And to the extent that we do understand these problems better now in terms of the monetary system, in terms of the fact that we can and should transform the macro economy to suit our purposes and not just somebody else's purposes. I think that that's um, in large part thanks to her work. And she's one of the first architects of the Green New Deal, really bringing understanding, uh, you know, really bringing these issues of environmental injustice and economic injustice together and thinking about how our societies could be economically more healthy and allow a long term habitability of the planet. Uh, and by long term, I don't mean that long term. We're talking about the next, the lifetime of, you know, my son and children born today. Uh, we have the potential within our current economic system. We have the drive and the direction within our current economic system to prevent the habit from being habitable for humans and sustaining human civilization within a century, by 2100 even. So in terms of ominousness, I can, I can raise the ominous bar. Uh, that's one of the things that um, you know, reading IPCC reports will do. Um, we, we are in a, in a state of very, very grave danger. And one of the things that's the most dangerous in our current situation that's preventing us from transforming our societies to being healthier and um, enabling future life is our economic systems. So they need to be transformed completely. Uh, because they've shown themselves time and time again not to be up to the task. So I would say that I, I, I agree fully with uh, what Dr. Pettifor has been saying. And I think that we have scientists, econ you know, we have economists, we have health scientists, we have climate scientists, we have all these experts. And sometimes experts is, a, is an insult. <laughs> but we have these experts who've been predicting that we need to pay attention to these problems and that they are deadly serious. And now that we see them being deadly serious in real life, what we see is that the people who want to maintain these market profits for the 1% are doubling down, even while people, you know, even while my local hospital is at capacity and is sending people away because of COVID, um, even while climate disasters are happening all over the world and destroying crops and burning up Australia and California and so on. People, these people are still saying, oh no, this is not the real problem. Oh no, we need to keep doing things just as we were. Oh no, if you give money to rich people, they will develop technology that will save us all. So please don't stop us now, you know, because things are going in the right direction. And it's like, so we, we, we see, and we're seeing science denial happening across the board. We're seeing this sort of denial of reality happening around us, um, which, which I think is quite frightening. So I think we are, we are living in very frightening times and we really yes. need to act very, very strongly against this. Good. So this is the seventh edition of this uh, conversation we have with all these international economists around the world on the future of capitalism. And actually we are researching in a public way um, what morality we have to enter into the market uh, uh, to, to, make it, to, to, to make it a productive, mm -hmm. healthy, just uh, a system. Um, we, we had a conversations where we talked about how to to balance the power relations or restore the power relation between capital and labor. We talked about taxation. We talked about uh, stopping the concentration of two unhealthy power constructions within the market, about global taxes, systems, transfer uh, 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 options towards uh, 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 impoverished part of the, of the world. Um, so, so we already, and we talked a lot about democracy and political institutions, actually. Um, and what I really would like to do with the two of you is to see who should do what. Um, is it possible to just um, uh, um, amend the current economic system, or should we look for a, a, a bigger, radical, more radical? Uh, 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 change and who should be acting. Uh, um, and Pettifor, can I ask you to start with making a list together who should do what to transform this, to transform the current market system? So, um, as Julia said earlier, you know, it's up to civil society to create a ruckus okay. in order that we can then create the political... Uh, environment, but also the politicians that we need to lead us, right? Now that's beginning to happen. I mean, we see that happening with Black Lives Matter, you know. Black Lives Matter is a really huge democratic issue. Um, and 
it's it's creating new environments across the world, right? It's changing societies across the world, not just in the United States. But then it is the job of governments, of states, to actually take a role. Now, I'm, I'm not an anarchist. I believe that the state is an, our collective will, and we ought to make the state exercise our collective will in a way that protects our interests. And the state is actually the only institution that can do this. For me, the, the really major task, if we are to survive climate breakdown and, and the collapse of biodiversity and future pandemics, then we have to transform at least four sections, four sectors of the economy. We have to transform the energy sector. We have to transform the transport sector. We have to transform the sector engaged in the use of land, agriculture. And we have to transform the caring sector, right? Okay. And in order to do that, those are big transformations that can't be done by the market. The market has failed dismally. The market can't create jobs. It can't defend public health and it can't tackle a virus. And it certainly can't <laughs> tackle climate breakdown. So the state has to do this. And the state can mobilize finance to do this because backing up the state here in Britain are 30 million taxpayers. In the United States, I don't know, it's 60 to 100 million taxpayers. In Europe, it's about, again, 120 million taxpayers. Yes. Now, those people regularly pay their taxes into the state's treasury, and that gives the state and the central bank enormous power to create new credit because they know that they're backed up by us taxpayers, right? right? And they can use that new credit, that finance, as has happened actually in uh, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, to generate the kind of spending that's needed to ensure our survival, right? The private sector can't do that, even though the private sector is awash with capital. It, it doesn't have the amount of capital needed, and it certainly doesn't have the will to do it. So, um, so the, the actors have to be civil society and government and politicians, civil society, politicians, political parties and governments. We've got to change our political parties. They're way behind where we have to be for transformation. They're living in the 19th century, most of them, basically. I mean, and, and, and so we have to transform our political parties, which requires collective will. Yeah. You know, if we wash our hands and say, sorry, I don't like politics, it's ugly, and sure is ugly, let's face it. That means we can't build political parties that represent us. We've got to get in there and dirty our hands <laughs> by becoming politically active. Yes. So we've yes. got civil society, political parties, yeah. elected politicians in a democracy, and then the state. Actually, those are the key actors for transformation. Yeah. yeah. Yes, very clear. Thank you. So, um, in your book, uh, uh, Dr. Pettifor, you mentioned uh, a couple of uh, green deals that we've seen over the last decade, right? So, you have a green deal in the UK, a United States green deal, and now uh, this year we've seen the European Green New Deal, which you could say is is kind of a solution in line with your with your line of thinking, right? It's a, 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 it's a government, but also civil society. It's multiple of these actors, politicians as well. Um, do you think that, well, first off, what is your opinion on the European uh, New Green Deal? Do you think it's enough? So I'm one of those, and there are not many of us that think this, that is a great supporter of the European Green Deal. You know, in America, it's been dissipated. Uh, the Democrats don't want to talk too much about the Green New Deal, and they don't. In Britain, you know, we have a government which... Put, they make speeches, but they have done nothing. But in Europe, we see both the institutions of the state, i.e. the European Commission, the parliament, the democratic uh, expression of European will, and civil society working together to set what is quite a bold target to cut emissions by 60% by, is it 2030, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the thing I, I admire most about the European initiative is that the promise is to put this into law. You know, Mrs. von der Leyen is a German and they believe in the law. And I mean, that's extraordinary. We're, not, we're nowhere near doing that in, in Britain and the United States. Now, of course, what we also know is that there are states in Europe that are opposed to this Green Deal. It's, by the way, it's not a new deal. They're not talking about transforming the financial system or the economic system, but they are talking about 
bold ecological um, targets, really. And of course, what's happening is that the fossil fuel industries are in Brussels as I speak and throwing money around and lobbying and putting enormous pressure on the institutions and buying politicians, right? And our politicians are so supine or so spineless, they're easily bought, right? So that we have a huge problem. So although it's very exciting, you know, we all know it's now a big, big fight. But in my view, at least there is a fight there that's worth fighting for because there is institutional backing for mm. the fight. Mm. Furthermore, what Mrs. van der Leyen has done uh, has to create the political space in which it's possible to discuss that. Now, I have experienced that directly. Um, my book has been translated into German, Italian and Swedish. And I'm giving interviews in Norway, all over across Europe, because across Europe, there is now intense interest in what has to be done to transform the economy and save the planet. Um, we don't have those debates in Britain, and they don't seem to me to be happening yeah. at a sufficient level of volume in the United States. So I'm excited by the European uh, Green Deal. Professor Steinberger, is this, can the same be said for you? Are you excited by the European Green Deal as well? I, I, th um, I think exactly for the, the same reasons that, uh, that Dr. Pettifor said. I mean, it's, it's um, of course it's imperfect, but it's happening. And it's happening at a heightened level of ambition because of this combination of huge social movements. I mean, and we have to remember that the Fridays for Future um, uh, I think they did it on Thursdays in Brussels, but the the, belt, the, the the Brussels presence of that movement of climate striking youth was immense. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of students in the streets uh, on an almost weekly basis. Really, really astounding. Um, so, so I think that we're, we're seeing that, 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 that confluence. I would reiterate the point, you know, just make emphasis on the point. If you're a European, you need to be watching your MEP like a hawk mm -hmm. because your MEP you can find out who your MEPs are. It's very easy on the web. You need to be watching them like a hawk because you can be you can guarantee that roughly a third of the of yours, the ones that respond to you because you're their constituents and you vote for them, are uh, are being taken over by the fossil fuel industry and are saying whatever they want them to say. So it it is very easy for the fossil fuel industry to get their voice heard in Brussels in a way that our voice is not heard. And I think that we need to be we need to become vigilant. I mean, we need to become these fighters who stand for something and who hold our politicians to account. Now, the thing with politicians and the thing with leaders that you have to understand is leaders don't really lead. They kind of follow and they follow where popular pressure is. They follow where the letters are. They follow where outspoken people on Twitter are. They um, re politicians respond extremely well to bullying, which is good because we can do that and we can say, how dare you listen to ExxonMobil? How dare you repeat the letters that they put, uh, mm. the talking points that they put in their personal letter to you? You know, it, we can really sh name them and shame them and actually change some things and also make their colleagues very afraid to go there, so if you make the example of a couple of people. So we have a lot of, uh, a lot of power in this in terms it of strengthening and making the system better, but it requires vigilance. It's not just because you have one or two good politicians that anything will happen. You yeah. need to be on everybody's case okay we need that to be, is a, we need to be a lot more yeah a lot more muscular in our in our in our view of our politicians yes and that's economic pressure too Good. Uh, it, it actually uh, resonates with a question from one of the people who is watching now. Um, and of course, this is not a television show. This is, uh, we, we, all, we would have loved to do this with hundreds of people in a venue, right? And now people are just watching, but also sending question in through Zoom. Uh, and one of the, the people who've been watching all editions is Eveline Verhaag. And we're honored that she's, she's, she's one of our uh, viewers who's, 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 who's combining also the debates and she's hearing all these things uh, and so she has a question uh, uh, which is um, should a scientist she asks what should sci scientists do uh, should they become activists um, uh, uh, is, is, is it is it a very easy short yes for that let me see <laughs> I think they should I think they should become advocates and advocates. not ad okay. activists. what's the difference activists, you know I think they should become advocates and they should make sure that they communicate their science 
clearly. Okay. They scientists on the whole are designed to not communicate well. They they don't believe communication <laughs> is important. And that's a big flaw. They have to talk to the public. Yes. But I would have them as advocates, not activists. Clear. And 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 uh, uh, Professor Steinberger. Uh, I'm very clear on this. I've signed multiple statements yeah. and been out on the streets. So I believe that scientists, and if, if especially on the climate side or on social justice side, if we are to be true to the evidence of the science that we're seeing, and we're true to, we have to take seriously the fact that governments are not acting on our warnings, we have to be out in the streets too. Yes. So at, so, at some point, we have to be absolutely, we have to act with integrity and understanding of the reality around us. And that means becoming activists as well, including uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. Clear. Uh, another question from some of some, somebody who's watching us now, and that's Emma Robel. And she's halfway in your book, uh, Miss Pettiflor. Uh, and uh, and she, uh, she's um, wondering, she was comparing your uh, ideas with uh, Professor Sachs, which was joining us last, who was joining us last week. Um, and uh, she would like you to assess the need for global institutions. What is your, because Professor Sachs, Sachs last week advocated for the idea of more global institutions, also tax institutions. Um, what is your position on that do we need that more in order to for instance a global uh, a new green deal no i'm opposed to the uh, to the introduction of more global institutions basically those who are arguing for global institutions want to maintain globalization and i think globalization has been devastating for the world economy what i do want to see is international coordination and multilateral action so for example We've watched as our leaders have poured contempt on the World Health Organization and withdraw funding from it. Now, the World Health Organization is a place where we coordinate and we cooperate. We have these institutions, uh, but they are ignored by our political leaders who don't believe in them. So um, for me, the, the far more important thing, if we want to, for example, make sure that Apple pays its taxes, we need powers to manage the, the flow of capital across borders capital mobility. It's the fact that we've given them the power to move their capital when they like, where they like, for whatever reason they like, that they don't pay taxes. They love that law, and it is a law, right? When the European Union challenged Apple and demanded that Apple pay $13 billion in taxes instead of hiding it away in, in a tax um, haven that's called Ireland, the court, the general court, supported Apple against the EU, right? And that's because it is the law. The law is that if people have got capital, they can move it around. If people bodies have bodies and, and want to move around and get jobs, that's very difficult, right? And even with trade, there is friction. With money, there is no friction yeah. whatsoever. And that's why Apple is able to swish all its money out and avoid taxes while you and I, who can't move out to Ireland or can't, can't move our finances to Ireland, we pay taxes, we the little people. So we've got to do something about managing the flow of capital. And I don't think you need an institutional, an, a global institution to do that. You need a new global order, which gives countries, individual nations, powers over the money that flows in and out of their economy, Clear. you know, and how it, how, and whether or not it's taxed. That power should be restored yeah. to democratic states. Yeah. Yes. But then again, uh, um, Dr. Pettifor, some would argue that we need these global institutions in order, for example, to prevent carbon leakage, right? Or uh, in order, so how, how should we, how do you reconcile those two positions? Well, we have a United Nations. We have the IPCC. We have ways of collecting data and monitoring. There's no difficulty in managing that process through existing institutions. Um, uh, what we need is international cooperation and coordination. And that would require leadership from states. And that's another reason why I think the European Green Deal is so important, because the Europeans can now help lead the world in coordinating, working together, making the transfers that are necessary uh, and the cuts in emissions that are necessary for sustainability. In the past, it was the United States that was supposed to take that role. The United States has given up that role, so we can push them to the sidelines. 
Europe cannot step forward and, on the basis of its values, begin a process of international coordination and multilateral action. And, you know, we have plenty of institutions in which that, that kind of coordination can take place. Clear. Um, one of the questions um, uh, from the audience uh, is John Gelderblom is asking, OK, so let's go back to your example of the Bra Brazil government um, uh, that at that tree of the rainforest has much more economic value at the moment than a, a tree which is alive. Uh, so um, um, the question is, should the rainforest tree be priced and be part of the economy? So what instruments should we revent for governments in for, like Brazil to protect, to be able to protect the trees in, um, um, in, in the future? I don't believe in putting a market price on such incredibly invaluable assets such as the Brazilian rainforest, right? The reason why Brazil does what she does is because of the nature of the global system which insists that international finance is powerful, that Brazil should borrow from Wall Street. She should not have her own central bank and manage her own finances. She should get money from Wall Street and then should repay Wall Street. To repay Wall Street, she's required to trade internationally. So the emphasis of economic policy is on the international system. And Brazil, therefore, is not looking at her domestic economy and caring about her environment and her people. That's the way the system is designed. It's designed to force governments into trade. It's designed to force governments into ex extracting their assets to repay finance capital, global capital. And that's the problem. We've got to change that architecture, which makes that happen, not put prices on something as invaluable as a rainforest. Clear. Um, uh, we are we are almost uh, uh, going back to Eliza, who kickstarted this conversation, and we're going to ask her to give a reflection on what she heard um, and how this builds on our research on how to reimagine capitalism or add morality to markets. Um, uh, so, so I just wanted to make sure that Professor Steinberger, this this just transition, um, is it? It, should we amend, because you said, OK, the Green Deal is not perfect, of course, you can critique it. Uh, what should we have on, what should we consider or amend it with to make it a more just um, instrument or policy? I think that that's something that has to be decided in, in consultation, for instance, with the unions, who were the, the people who started the just transition um, in the first place. Yes. But I agree that it's something that has to, um, it has to follow the line of, uh, in my view, one of the things we have to do is we have to consider the economy from the perspective of sectors we need to grow. Yes. Sectors we need to transform and sectors we need to degrow. And we also have communities that are going to be affected in different ways, including workers, but not only workers, from these transformations. And a lot of the transformations are going to be very positive, for instance, for the people suffering from air pollution or deprivation right now. Um, but a lot of the transformations might be difficult for communities that have relied on certain types of jobs. And we need to, we need to come up with agreements from those communities. So it has to be from the bottom up, including consultation with them. And yes, it does include um, redistribution of finance and changing those, uh, those, those parameters. I just wanted to add one thing to what uh, Dr. Pettifor said, which is we need to also think about the international institutions that need to be destroyed, <laughs> which are the debt imposing institutions. Um, so we have international institutions that are enacting and perpetuating vast amounts of harm and uh, wealth um, stratification across the world. We need to think of uh, getting rid of those um, maybe before we build anything else. Which ones? Uh, which 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 ones are you thinking about on your destruction list? Um, I think, for instance, uh, organizations like the International Monetary Fund has been taken over um, uh, very clearly by neoliberal policies and ideologies around uh, the Chicago School and structural adjustment programs and sort of enforcing policies of debt and payment of fees for schools. You know that you, the state can no longer allow the state can no longer be the vehicle of emancipation. The state can no longer give education and health care and services like water and sanitation to its uh, citizens. It has to extract fees from them and impose inequality and indebtedness on them. 
So those kinds of programs clearly have to be destroyed. And the IMF has been a huge vehicle for those and has never truly been called into account for actually overturning development in, in, in multiple countries around the world. So that would be, uh, that would be one example. Um, the other thing I just wanted to uh, recognize is that right now there is an MEP, and I'm just, because I'm absolutely rubbish at remembering names, I'm just gonna look up his name again. Um, he's called, uh, let's see, Pierre Laroutureau, Pierre Laroutureau, who's on his seventh day of hunger strike because he's trying to get a new, uh, something new installed in the European Union, which is a, a financial transaction tax in order to generate the kinds of revenue that would be necessary for a socially just Green New Deal. And I just wanted to highlight um, his, his work. If you go to climateandjobs.eu, you'll find out more about that because uh, he's obviously somebody who's taking a leadership position that's strong enough and injecting morality into his work that he's enacting, um, uh, taking a toll on his own, his own health. And I think that uh, I just wanted to recognize what, he, what he's standing up for. Yes, um, uh, it's interesting because, of course, uh, in one hour we cannot have a sector-specific conversation, right? And, of course, Dr. Padafor said we, folk, we have to transform energy, transport, land, agriculture and, and care. Um, and you said we have to really look at per-sector growth, transform or degrowth. Um, and, and in order to have a, uh, a, um, a debate which is nuanced but also... Um, um, honoring uh, the knowledge experts have, we have to focus on that level, right? And to, to have the a fruitful conversation, I can imagine. Thank you for, 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 for telling us that. Uh, uh, do, Dr. Pettifor, you have um, uh, somehow, um, oh no, with your, all your knowledge, you, can, you, you could predict... Um, uh, uh, the crisis, uh, uh, which the, the big financial crisis, and uh, if you if you look at the coming years, um, are these social movements, which uh, which we both of you say we really need to transform democratic institutions, um, are they are they uh, strong enough? Or what should we do as a well com community of thinkers um, uh, to make sure that these communities are st or, or or organizations are strong enough? What can you say about that? I can say this: that there's never been change in the world without societal pressure, basically from below. Um, so, you know, we know that we have women's rights. Women's have, women have rights uh, in some places, perhaps not always in Poland, but women have rights because of the fight that we fought back in the day, the demonstrations we went on to give women the vote, for example. We know, for example, that the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement have led to legal changes, to structural changes to society. I know from my own experience that my activism in the anti-apartheid movement and that of millions of people around the world brought down the apartheid government. So, you know, I have seen great transformations in my lifetime and they've been brought about by people. So, of course, we're strong enough. We just have to keep going. We just have to, you know, Greta cannot afford to give up. Mm. We need her. We need her to keep fighting and we need her to keep inspiring all the rest of us to keep fighting because that's the way we're going to get transformation. And for me, you know, it's happening. We mustn't, we mustn't be too pessimistic. Um, these change, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were told there is no magic money tree, money tree, right? We were told that austerity was the answer to the world's problems. Mm -hmm. Suddenly there was a magic money tree. Suddenly we found money to bail out everybody. Blah. Suddenly austerity is very unfashionable, even on the right. Okay. Who would have thought that could happen? But it wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been fighting in the meantime in the background all the time. Clear. So, um, so I, I'm very conf I'm confident that we can bring about a transformation. I'm not sure that we have enough time. And I think we are being too slow. I worry that we're going to have some cataclysmic shock. Mm. I mean, already we're seeing cataclysmic shocks. You know, in the Philippines, as I speak, there's a typhoon which is unheard of in terms of its strength, right? So they already are being devastated by yes. this. But yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we need... What will happen is, for example, my, my prediction is that 
a very big city, say New York or London or Amsterdam, would you know disappear overnight because of because of, for example, uh, in the case of New York. Um, the Typhoon Sandy, do you remember? Mm. Yes. That very nearly sank Wall Street, basically. If we have some big catastrophic area at the centre of our civilizations, I think we'll find overnight everything yeah. will change. Well, but, but only because we've been building up that pressure. Clear. You know, as, we, as we are organising this on uh, November the 2nd in Amsterdam in 2020, it's the hottest November the 2nd uh, in our life or in our history. Um, let's go to Eliza. Uh, Eliza um, uh, Terragno Bogliaccini, uh, you uh, kickstarted the conversation. Can you reflect upon what you heard uh, with uh, these two economists? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, firstly wanted to say that um, as an active member of Rethinking Economics, um, so we, we actively try to uh, change economic curricula. It is really uh, great to have scholars such as yourselves um, explicitly linking uh, money creation and the financial system to climate environmental crisis. It is really, really uh, useful for us uh, to use. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, and then I wanted to add that I, it makes me very hopeful to hear that you place civil society at the core of action. Um, and specifically, I wanted to put this on the table. Um, how would a prosumer energy uh, economy, would that sound to you? Do you think this is uh, feasible in the current uh, political climate? Ooh, Professor Steinberger. So among the papers that I haven't yet written, but I really need to, I think that um, that, that one of the, pro, the idea of the prosumer, which is that people are producing energy, but they're also consuming it. And the idea that we can have, uh, you know, worker consumer cooperatives or community cooperatives um, sort of nested into a larger national or international network, that we, we can actually make economic institutions that look democratic and that look like our community life. And if I think of the society of the future that I want to be engaged in, first of all, it is not a consumer society. Consumerism is a devouring. That used to be the analogy. You consume something when you like destroy it. So we need to move away from this, right? We're, we're devouring the world. Um, so, but we need to move. We, so certainly the idea of being the creators of being, and I think the exchangers or the participants or giving back as much as we get from our environment and our communities is something that we need to be looking forward to. And I think that this is a future of less consumption. So less material consumption, less materialism, yeah, frugality, yeah. sufficiency, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. but of a lot of public participation. And when you look at well-being studies, which is one of my areas, you find that people benefit the most from being able to communicate and exchange and work together. And so where you would have a lot of community participation, for instance, in community energy schemes or community agriculture or child care, mm -hmm. because we have this whole idea of the caring economy and caring jobs are green jobs. Um, which is one of the which is one of the reasons that they're the core one of the core aspects one of the core sectors of the of the green new deal um, and, you know we have we have to be taking care of each other and that means caring for older people the most vulnerable educating children so all of these things are things that we can participate in and have roles in where we're not yeah. just um, the beneficiaries or the or but also the, the creators, but we're also the producers. Yeah. And so in the Netherlands, you would say it's 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 either the liberative democracy participating in the policy making, but also in the acting of producing yeah. public value, uh, where where you can have participation or democracy. Um, uh, Eliza, this is a risk. If if I, I ask you to reflect on it, and you you say I want to also ask uh, questions <laughs> because then your four minutes go up uh, to this to to these to these other. Sorry. Because it's so far, no, it's not your no. fault. Uh, 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 so, so, so we only have like a minute left. So, final thought. Just uh, thank you very much for both of your work. You're very inspiring, personally, um, <laughs> and I think to my generation definitely. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for this women-dominated conversation. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, and uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Steinberg, uh, Dr. Pedifor, for joining us uh, in Amsterdam uh, and through in the internet, uh, both of you from, uh, from, your, from your work at home, uh, uh, for this public research we are doing, actually, with, uh, with people who are watching and here in the studio. Thank you so much. And 
um, that gives me time to thank you, the, the viewers, of course, and the participants to this inquiry, and invite you for next week, where we're going to go talk about uh, corporate power concentrations and how to check and break them. Um, uh, uh, see, look, look for further information on theswijger.nl or on moralmarkets.org slash future markets consultations. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.